años. Hello everyone, today we're going to speak about shell fragments and what kind of information can be deduced from the various fragments that can be found on a battlefield. What you have to understand is that on battlefields, on modern battlefields, shell fragments are the most common find that's made during uh, metal detecting or archaeological work. So it can be useful to be able to understand what can be deduced from them. Basically, uh, when you metal detect a battlefield, uh, your finds look something like this and most people just say oh this is a shell fragment and don't try to understand any further than that and sometimes people even sell these fragments off for the copper weight or things like that and the goal of this video is to give you some basic information about what kind of fragments can be found and what kind of information can be deducted from each kind of uh, shell fragment for example, if I show this to you right now, or this, most of the viewers probably have no clue whatsoever what these things are, and at the end of the video, you will know what these are. And it looks boring, but believe me, it's actually going to be very interesting. So first of all, what is a shell? Um, what you have at the top of this image is a 7mm bullet, and at the bottom you have a 75mm shell. So what is a shell? It's just basically a very large bullet. And what is the definition? Well, uh, a bullet that is larger than two centimeters, so 20 millimeters, is no longer called a bullet, it's called a shell. That's just the definition. So the smallest shell caliber possible is 20 millimeters, and then it can be as large as you want. Uh, it can even be humongous, huge, weighs several tons. There's no upper limit to the shells. So a shell is a large bullet, and to fire a shell, well, you need a large gun, which is what artillery guns are. Here you see this artillery man is uh, preparing to put a 75mm shell into his 75mm uh, cannon. And here you have an example of a cannon firing. So when you see a cannon, what it fires is shells. And uh, what we saw in the earlier image was the bullet and shell with their casings. And once the bullet or shell are fired, then they look like this. This is the projectile on its own. So what is a shell made of? A bullet is small, so it's usually just uh, lead with, uh, with a copper jacket. But a shell is much bigger, so it can be, it has more room inside it. So what it's usually made for is to explode, uh, to cause numerous wounds. And then of course there's different kinds of shells. There can be gas shells, anti-tank shells, etc, etc. But in this video we're going to concentrate on explosive shells. So because it's bigger it's actually more complicated than a bullet and basically a shell you can divide it into three parts anatomically. You have the driving band, you have uh, the fuse at the front of the shell usually, sometimes it's at the back, and you have the shell body. So let's go into some more details now. Uh, firstly about the driving band. So as everybody knows when a bullet is fired from a weapon, the bullet spins on its long axis to be stabilized by a gyroscopical effect. Okay, And uh, to have that spin, you have rifling inside the barrel of the weapon that spins, and that makes the bullet spin as it goes out of the weapon. And uh, this is what a fired bullet looks like, and you can see it has the remains of rifling grooves on its surface. And what's important to understand is that a bullet has a copper jacket. So copper is a soft metal. Okay, so when the bullet is fired, the soft copper from the bullet is in contact with the grooves of the barrel of the weapon. And the barrel of the weapon is a hard metal. It's made of steel. So copper against steel is not an issue. The steel is stronger, so it wins and it imprints the rifling grooves into the copper of the bullet. Now for a shell, it's a different story, because the shell is not made of copper, it's made of steel. So steel shell, steel weapon firing it, 
uh, the steel rifling grooves of the barrel will not be able to have any effect on the steel of the shell because it's two hard metals together. So to solve that issue, what you have on artillery shells is this driving band, which is made of copper or brass. I'm not sure. In this video, I always just say copper. Uh, sometimes I mean brass, whatever. It's just a detail. Okay? So how does this work? This is a shell. As I said, this shell is made of steel. And the, in order to have this rifling system work, this spinning system, well, they make this driving band. So it's a piece of copper, a copper belt that goes all around the shell, a copper ring, and that sticks out slightly from the, from the level of the shell, as you can see. It sticks out. It's, uh, the, the diameter of the driving band is slightly superior to the diameter of the shell. And what happens? So you have your weapon with the rifling grooves, you have your shell, you have your driving band, and the whole point of this is that when the shell is put into the weapon, that only the copper driving band is going to be in contact with the, the rifling of the inside of the weapon. So what it looks like, this is an unfired driving band, so as you can see it's smooth, and then when you put the shell inside the weapon, the copper driving band is going to be compressed uh, by, the, by the rifling grooves, and now you see when the, when the shell is fired, the rifling grooves imprint themselves on the copper driving band, and this makes the shell spin at high speed and keeps it stable point first during its flight. So that is the point of the driving band, to make the shell spin and keep it stable. And when the shell is going to reach its target, it's going to explode, and uh, the driving band is also going to be blown to pieces. So when you're searching a battlefield, what you're typically going to find is something like this. You see these are fragments of driving band with the rifling of the weapon imprinted in them. These pieces are actually not typical because they're larger than usual, than usual pieces. Usually the pieces are smaller. And uh, when you look at the rear side of the driving band, it also has characteristic marks that are going to be dependent. You know, every country, factory, caliber of shell, etc. is going to have a uh, little uh, different sorts of patterns. So this can be recognized. So what do we notice with these driving bands? Well, it's pretty obvious that the larger the shell is, the larger the driving band is. Here there's a 20 millimeter shell, so it has a tiny little driving band, and then here there's a very large caliber shell, and it has a huge driving band. So in practical terms, when you're going to be searching on your battlefield, you're going to notice that you're going to find uh, driving bands of different sizes. And if you get familiar with uh, the, the units and the weapons that were used on the battlefield you're investigating, you're quickly going to start figuring out what driving bands correspond to what caliber of shell. So, for example, on this battlefield from southern France, where American troops were involved in 1944, uh, you basically always find three types of driving bands, three sizes. And by comparing with unfired shells, I was able to quickly figure out, see if it's a, the thinnest one you find is a 75 millimeter then you have 105 millimeter, then you have 155 millimeter. And then every now and then I find this very large driving band. I don't know what caliber this is from, but I have been able to figure out it's from some large caliber Navy shells, so fired from very big cannons that were on boats. So let's see a little neat example. This is a piece of wood that was uh, ringing with a metal detector, and you see it has a little hole in it. So I brought it home, and at home I cracked a piece of wood in half. And what you find inside, a piece of 75 millimeter driving band from World War II. Another neat detail, here you have two driving bands, so the lower one is from uh, American 75 millimeter, and you can see it's completely made of copper. And you see this upper driving band is part copper but mostly iron, you see they're trying to save on the copper. And I presume this is a German one, uh, because the Germans were short of resources during the war, so they invented all kinds of methods to try to save precious metals and try to save resources. So this one is a construction that saves as much copper as possible, whereas this one is, let's say, more wasteful. So another neat detail. Uh, what another kind of deduction that can be made from uh, driving bands? This is, um, 
I found, a, let's say, a large hole in the ground that looked like a dugout. And uh, in and around the hole, I found things like this. And what is this? You see, this is a driving band that has not been fired because it has no grooves from the rifling on it. But you can see it's obviously been on a shell that exploded because it's damaged and, and blown apart. So what does this mean? This means that this is a driving band from a shell that was not fired but that exploded. In other words, it's from an ammunition dump that was blown up for some reason. And then the other things that we find, for example, these uh, unfired but very bent bullets or bullet casings, this is also typical from a blown ammunition dump. So now we'll go to the next part of the shell anatomy, the shell fuse, which is the, the most interesting part. So the shell fuse is the system that makes the shell explode, that determines the moment when the shell is going to blow up. And uh, it's usually quite solid, so you can usually find it uh, either intact or else in, let's say, larger pieces. And it's usually made of some uh, either aluminum or copper, not just iron, so it usually rings very well with the metal detector, just like the driving band. So this is a piece that metal detectors find quite often. So um, even when, when they're damaged, like these ones, uh, you can see that they usually remain quite intact and quite large. So what kind of information can be derived from um, the shell fuse. Well, first of all, you have usually very obvious markings. So, for example, this is a German shell. You have the year of manufacture. This, I think, is the factory code for the factory that built the shell. And then you have the type of shell here. So it actually gives you a lot of information uh, in a very obvious form. This shell here is much more damaged, but you can see it also has its markings perfectly preserved. See, this thing was fired, it exploded, it spent seven years buried in the ground, and when you look at it, it looks perfectly brand new, uh, as if it was made just yesterday. So sometimes people think or assume that when a shell explodes, you know, there's almost nothing that remains that would be recognizable, and this is a fine example that shows that that is completely wrong. Uh, the fragments are still usually very recognizable. And uh, regarding nationality, well, you know, just take a look at this, eagle and swastika. So uh, more information that can be derived pretty easily from, uh, from a shell fuse. This one here you see is heavily bent, so it gives you the angle of impact. You see it hit the ground at about 45 degree angle, and you can see the metal on the opposite side was, uh, was broken off by the impact. And um, so when, when a shell explodes, what people often assume is that fragments go in all directions equally, you know, like a kind of sphere. And that is actually very wrong because the shells you see, they have this, this shape kind of like a, a bottle. And uh, the fragments usually go perpendicular away from, from, the, from an explosion. And since the shell is not spherical, while the fragments do not at all go in all directions, what they actually do is almost all the fragments go off to the sides then you have a few that go front and backwards, and then you have uh, some directions where there's virtually no fragments at all. This is another drawing illustrating the same thing. So basically, as it shows here, 80% of the fragments go away with what they call the side cone. Then you have 10% front and back, and then some directions you have almost nothing. And this may seem rather theoretical, but it's not theoretical at all, as you can see with this uh, wall in Sarajevo. You can see that there's a whole bunch of shrapnel holes, and they're, they're, they're basically almost perfectly lined up here. So you can see this is the side cone here that caused all these fragments. And then when the side cone finishes, there's nothing, no more fragments at all. So what this means in practical terms is that when they first made shells, they made them with a fuse so that the shells would explode upon hitting the ground. That's what you call a super quick mechanism. The shell touches the ground and explodes immediately. And since the shell is usually coming at an angle, what that actually means is that almost all the fragments will either be blown straight into the ground or else be blown pretty much up into the air. So. Um, that means that the shell fragments are not being used effectively and uh, for people standing just within a few meters of the explosion site maybe they're not going to be hit by these fragments. 
So what they realize is that for the shell to be more effective, what you have to do is an air burst. You have to make the shell explode in the air before actually hitting the ground. And then all these fragments that would normally be blown into the ground, well instead they're going to be blown towards the ground where the enemy is. And this is going to be a much more deadly effect. Another thing they notice is that if the enemy troops are in, let's say, bunkers or even just in the houses, with a super quick mechanism, the shell is going to come, hit, let's say, the wall of the house or the roof of the dugout and explode immediately without penetrating the house or dugout. And so the people inside the house or dugout are not going to be affected. And uh, what you need is a delay mechanism so that the shell will be able to go through the wall or through the roof of the dugout and then explode a split second later where then it will kill the enemy troops. So let's see how this happens in practice. Here you have an American M54 fuse. Uh, despite the fact it exploded and then was in the ground for seven years, you can see that it's uh, still in very good condition and you can actually read the fuse type on it. It says fuse, time and super quick M54. So let's see how this thing actually works in practice. So this is the technical drawing of, uh, of the M54 and let's see the details. So here you have the front of the shell with a firing pin and behind the firing pin there is a primer. So when the shell is going to hit the ground this firing pin is going to come back and hit the primer and make the primer explode. And then you have a hollow tube that goes all the way through the shell, the, the flash, flash tunnel. So the explosion from the primer is going to go down the flash tunnel and then you see here in the middle of the flash tunnel you have something that's blocking the way. This is called the interrupter. So what this does is it prevents the shell from exploding as you see. So this is actually a safety mechanism. So let's imagine that somebody, you know, as the shell is being transported in a train for example, somebody takes the shell to the train, drops it onto its point, the primer explodes, but the shell does not explode because it has this interrupter that's blocking the way. So the interrupter prevents the shell from exploding. So what happens when the shell is fired? Well, the shell is fired. We said it spins due to the rifling at very high speed. That causes very strong centrifugal force. And so this interrupter, you see it's mounted on a spring. With the centrifugal force, it's going to be pushed outwards. That will open the, the flash tunnel. And thus, once this is open, uh, when the primer will explode, the flash tunnel will be open all the way down and the shell can explode. So this is the mechanism for super quick. You have a firing pin, the shell hits the ground, hits the primer, the primer explodes, the flash goes all the way down and causes the shell to explode immediately. Now, what is the second mechanism that, that can be used to make the shell explode in the air before hitting the target as an airburst? So you see there's actually a second mechanism in the shell. There's this weight here with space behind it so that it can move. And then there's another primer here with uh, another little firing pin mechanism. So what happens when the shell is fired? It has a huge acceleration. So this weight is going to come back, hit the firing pin, make this primer explode. And then the primer explosion is going to go down here there's, a, there's what we call the upper, upper disc and lower disc with powder here. And the, the, the flame is going to go down the discs, down this little uh, secondary uh, flash tunnel, and going to make the shell explode. So in this two-dimensional drawing, uh, you don't really understand what these two uh, rings are for. But on this drawing, you're going to understand much better. So here you have the weight, you have the second primer, and then you have the upper ring and lower ring. And what you see is that in these rings, you have what you call powder trains. So what's going to happen is that the primer explodes and then the flame has to go all down this powder ring, this, this powder train, all the way down, all the way down, here, 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 before finally coming to the location where it will cause the explosion. And uh, so this is going to take several seconds and the shell is made so that it actually has these settings outside in seconds. You see it has a line here and then you can set the time 
for example, on this shell from zero seconds to something like 25 seconds. So what the artillery people do is they know the distance from their target, they know the time it's going to take for the shell to reach the target, and if you know it's going to take, for example, 20 seconds or 19 seconds for the shell to reach the target, then you're going to set it slightly before that. And these time frames are going to make the shell explode just before it reaches the target, and it's going to explode in the air and have this airburst effect. So with this M54 type fuse, we look again, there's two mechanisms, either the super quick that sends the explosion straight down the, the first flash tunnel, or else the delay mechanism that goes through the discs and then uses the second uh, flash tunnel. So there's actually two possible flash tunnels and you can, uh, you can see these on an example of a shell. This is the super quick one and this is the delay one. This is the same thing, super quick and delay. And what you see here is that when the shell explodes, when it's set with delay mechanism, part of the blast of the shell goes back up the flash tunnel and the blast causes this lower time ring to become bent. See the blast goes back up and actually bends the metal. And if you look at it from the side again, you can see the metal is bulging out here in front of uh, where the line is, and the, the li the, this line is also lined up with the flash tunnel. And you can see that the aluminum here was blown away. So basically, when the, ti when the shell is set for a delay, you actually have, and, and, and it explodes, the delay actually becomes imprinted in the metal via this, this bulging. So what I mean by that is here you find a, a fragment of an M54 fuse on its own. It's just the lower ring. The fuse is destroyed, blown up. And you can see that the ring is bulging outwards here. So you can deduce that this shell was fired with uh, the fuse delay, not, a, not in super quick, and that it was set at approximately 19 seconds. So the artillerymen were 19 seconds away from their target. So you can see the kind of interesting deductions. And um, here there's several um, M54 fuses that were found on the same battlefield, and if you look at them, all of them are set at approximately 19 or 18 seconds, and all of them are bulging out uh, in the location in front, of the, in front of the flash hole. There. So from this you can see, since all these fuses are set at the same time, you can presume they were probably fired from approximately the same distance, and from artillery batteries that were uh, probably quite near each other. And now here you have three other fuses, and you can see that all of them are set on S, which means safe. Safe doesn't mean it's actually safe, it just means that the, that the time mechanism is, is off. If you fire it on safe, then it's, it's going to explode in a super quick mode and without the time delay. And what you notice with uh, these fuses that are set on S, so for super quick, uh, is that they're usually in much worse condition. And why is that? So here you have one that's set for a delay, and here you have one that was set for super quick. The delay one is in magnificent condition, and the super quick one is all bent. Why is that? It's because this shell, it exploded in the air as an airburst, so then the fuse just, you know, fell to the ground on its own and didn't become too damaged. Whereas this one on the right, it actually hit the ground as a complete shell. So the whole weight of the shell was, uh, was uh, against the fuse when it hit the ground. And then plus it exploded upon hitting the ground. So usually uh, these, these ones that explode with, on contact with the ground are more damaged and in worse condition. You can see the same effect on this 20 millimeter shell head. You can see, you could imagine that this thing is actually new and unfired, but there are a couple of giveaways. The first thing is that you can see the, the screw thread here is uh, very damaged. And you can also see that the metal is cracked here, so it was obviously submitted to some kind of stress. So what's the explanation for this? Why is this 20 millimeter head in such good condition, and then you usually always find them in good condition? Well, these were used uh, usually for firing against aircraft, 
And what's going to happen if you fire a bunch of shells into the air at an aircraft? Well, most of them are going to miss their target. And then what's going to happen? The shells are going to keep on going and then they're going to come back down and then they're going to land on your own troops, on your own installations and maybe cause a lot of damage. So of course you don't want that. So what they did is they made these shells so that they would self-destruct after a, a short, very short period and then they would explode in the air. So basically this is a fuse from a shell that exploded in the air and then the fuse just harmlessly fell to earth on its own and that's why it's still almost uh, brand new despite having been fired. Now let's get to the delay shells. Uh, we're going to speak about uh, the Model 48 American fuse. So this is the technical drawing of it. So the, it, it can also function in two modes. We just saw the first type uh, can either function in super quick or in, delay, in, uh, yeah, in time delay. And this one is the same. It also functions in uh, super quick. So it has the same mechanism, a firing pin, a primer, and then uh, a flash tunnel. And it has, once again, the interrupter that uh, opens when uh, the shell is spinning with centrifugal force. And what happens if you want the delay, so for the time for the shell to penetrate its target before exploding? Well, on the interrupter there's a little screw that's visible from the outside that you can spin. And if you turn the screw, it prevents the interrupter from opening. So it means that the super quick mechanism can no longer work. And what happens if the super quick mechanism doesn't work? So the shell is going to be fired, hit the ground, have the super quick mechanism try to work but be blocked by this interrupter. And then you have a second fuse or a second system at the back of the shell, the exact opposite of in the M54. You have this weight with a space not behind this time but in front. And when the shell is going to hit the ground, there's a violent deceleration. This weight is going to come forward. You can see that there's another firing pin here and there's another primer. So with the violence of the impact, the primer is going to hit the firing pin, uh, going to explode. And then there's a little very short powder train to cause a delay of, for example, 0.1 or 0.2 seconds, which leaves the, the shell time to penetrate its target. And then it's going to cause the main explosion of the shell. These uh, M M48 fuses are much less solid. Uh, you usually find them in a more damaged condition. You find these various pieces like this. And uh, if you put the pieces back together, you can uh, rebuild uh, the fuse to, so it looks more or less what it looked like before exploding. You can see that here it has the screw on the side for the setting. This one here is made of brass for some reason and you can see this is the setting screw so depending on how you set it, it's either super quick or else delay. Here there's a piece of aluminum from the shell, you can see it still says delay, so this would have been the fragment from right beside the, the setting screw. And this is a German delay shell and you see it has a very similar mechanism. It has a delay here for 0.15 seconds and the screw. So you can set it with OV or else with MV. OV is ohne Verzögerung and MV is mit Verzögerung. So without delay or with delay. Another neat little fuse. So you, this is a piece of a German uh, shell fuse. And uh, it has these weird little cogs inside and you can wonder what those are for. And this is what they're for. Here you see the inside of the fuse. It has a primer. It has a firing pin. The firing pin is, uh, moves along with this whole piece of metal here. And you can see that the firing pin actually cannot move, cannot go into the primer, uh, because this green stuff here is blocking the way. And what is that green thing? Well, the green things are the little cogs that we just saw. So you see they're turned inwards. And when they're turned inwards, uh, the diameter of the, this opening is too small for the firing pin to be able to move. So what happens when the shell is fired? It starts spinning at extremely high speed and with centrifugal force this cog is going to open up and when it opens up then the second cog can open up and when the second cog opens up the third one can open up. So you can see it's a very neat safety system uh, that works with centrifugal force so that the shell cannot explode until it is actually spinning at a high speed. And when all the cogs open up, then the diameter of this opening increases 
and the firing pin can now move back and come onto the primer and cause the shell explosion. So these shells, uh, all these shells heads uh, as we're, that we're looking at, they're literally like clockwork, actually. And an artillery battery could fire thousands of these in a day if there was heavy fighting. So it's very interesting to see that something that was made on industrial scale is actually clockwork. Now, another interesting fact about these fuses, I told you before that uh, when a shell explodes upon hitting the ground, most of the fragments are just blown into the ground. And that's not just theoretical, that's actually true. You can verify it when you're metal detecting. Here, for example, all these uh, shell fragments from a fuse were found in the ground very close together. And what happens when you try to put them together, you see that they're all from the exact same fuse. So the shell exploded and all the fragments ended up in the ground at the exact same place, which demonstrates the inefficiency of this super quick type of explosion. Here you have another example of the exact same thing. Several fragments are found together and you can see that they can all be matched back up. And you can see that all the inscriptions are still also perfectly readable. And this is the same thing with remains of an American M48 fuse. You find three fragments in the ground and you can see that they all come from the exact same shell. Now, we've uh, gone into the driving band, into the fuse. So the driving band is there to make the shell spin and be stable. The fuse determines when the shell is going to explode and then the shell itself is, consists of the shell body. So it's a piece of hollow steel, kind of like a bottle, filled with explosives. And the point is for this to explode and be blown into hundreds or thousands of fragments. And this is a World War II German 88 millimeter shell, and these are all the fragments produced by one single shell. So you can see that there's hundreds and hundreds of fragments. And each of these fragments, if it hits somebody in the head, for example, is sufficient to kill him. And it can also easily go through things like steel helmets, as you can see here. So what about the speed of shell fragments? We haven't mentioned that yet. You can see that the, the speed of a shell fragment just after ex the explosion is, at a, is of about 2,000 meters per second, which is uh, twice as fast as a, as a rifle bullet. So they go at very high speed. However, because they're not stabilized and because they have very irregular shapes, they also slow down very fast. So you see that uh, within 50 meters of an explosion, the shell fragment already loses half its speed. So this is a fragment, the speed they go at, and you see that they very rapidly lose their speed with distance, whereas bullets, they go slower, but because they're pointed and stabilized, they uh, keep their speed much better over distance. So this is what typical shell fragments look like, the fragments of the shell body, and basically, unlike the driving band or the fuse, there's usually no uh, characteristics that can enable you to immediately figure out the nationality of the shell or the caliber of the shell. So these fragments, they're the most numerous, they're like 99% of the fragments, uh, but they don't give you very much information. Uh, the size of the fragments can basically be from dust. So here, for example, you see a French coin and it has a tiny little hole in it. And you can see that there's a shell fragment embedded inside the coin. So this is a fragment the size of a grain of rice. And then the fragments can basically be any size. Here you can see that the fragment is basically the entire shell that for some reason only burst into two pieces. It didn't explode properly. And a uh, little neat information. As before, you can match the two pieces together perfectly and you see they're from the same shell. So the shell, the shell fragment size is uh, very variable. And uh, I said they're, they're, they're not very characteristic, so usually you can't figure out what they're from, but there's exceptions, of course. Here you can see there's a very large fragment. So first of all, you can see just by the curvature, uh, when you have it in hand, that it's from a 75 millimeter shell. And plus it has the location for the driving band here, the driving band seat. And since you see the size of the drive, well, from the driving band seat, you can, you can determine the size of the driving band and then therefore determine the type and nationality of shell again. This fragment here, you see it, it's a lucky piece. It has some markings and uh, I'm not sure, can you recognize this? 
probably not, but let's look at the way the Germans mark their things. We saw before an eagle and swastika, so this one is very big and, rec and recognizable. But they also had the smaller stylized eagles, like these ones here, basically just showing the wings. And on our shelf fragment, it's actually a little eagle that's there. So you can deduce that this is from a German shell. This fragment here, it can be identified because you can see it has the location for the driving band, so the driving band seat. And here you can match it up with a piece of driving band, and you can see this is a piece of American 155 millimeter shell. Uh, more information that can be derived from shell fragments. If you're on a battlefield and, you know, you're metal detecting for two hours and you find one shell fragment, well, you're probably in a place that was not very heavily fought over. Here you look at the ground in the mountains, and there's one shell fragment here, one here, one here, one here. So there's four fragments just lying on the ground within one meter. And you can deduce that this place was probably subject to very intensive shell fire at some point. So when you're detecting it, it can be quite obvious. You can be at a location where the detector is ringing all the time with shell fragments, and then you're 50 meters away and it's not ringing at all anymore, and you can see that one location was a target of artillery fire, whereas the other location was not. Um, all these principles, so we talked about the fuse, driving band, and shell body. These principles remain the same, for example, for mortar shells. Every mortar shell is going to have a different construction according to its caliber and nationality. And when you find the fragments, for example, here there's a, there's a fragment of, uh, of mortar, you can see that it's matched up with an American mortar shell. And the same can be done with any other fragments. And it's also the same with grenades or other explosives. When you look for pieces, you find the pieces, and the pieces are very characteristic of whatever weapon caused the explosion. So to conclude, uh, from artillery shell fragments, you can derive actually a lot of information. You can, uh, you can determine according to what you find. Of course, you can't determine everything with one fragment, but if you find several fragments of fuse, of driving man, etc., you can know the caliber of the shell that exploded, the type of shell, the nationality of the shell, often the year of manufacture, the factory that manufactured it, usually it's marked in the shell. Uh, perhaps if it's a, a time shell, a time delay shell, you'll be able to figure out approximately the distance it was fired from, according to the time setting. You can see was the shell fired or not, according to the driving band imprints. And you can also see, was the weapon firing the shell new, or was it very worn out? Because on the driving band, you know, it has the, the grooves from the rifling of the cannon, and if the cannon is very worn out, well, then the grooves are not going to be as deep. So you can uh, determine a whole bunch of information from these shell fragments. So I'm hoping that with this uh, basic information, um, you're going to have a bit, of, a bit more respect for shell fragments if you find them with your metal detector. And for archaeologists, you understand that uh, being able to understand some basic information about shell fragments is pretty important if you're investigating a modern battlefield where artillery shells were used. So. Um, at the beginning of this video, you probably wouldn't have recognized these things, you know. Now you've had this short course and you can say, oh, this is uh, the tip of a Model 48 American fuse. Oh, this is a deriving band from a 155 millimeter American shell. This is uh, a time ring and, well, the lower and upper ring of an American Model 54 fuse with a delay mechanism. Oh, and these are little cogs from uh, a German shell, the little uh, cogs from the centrifu centrifugal force safety system. So once you become familiar with, uh, with the things that can be found on your local battlefield, then you can recognize a whole bunch of things just from a glance. Now we're talking about all these shell fragments as if it's, you know, fun stuff and clockwork, but in actual fact, uh, shell fragments were made to kill people, and they did kill a lot of people. During World War I and World War II, shell fragments are responsible for something like 80 or 90 percent of battlefield deaths. Shell fragments could go through helmets like butter, as you can see here on a German and, uh, and a Russian helmet. And they could hit anything, you know. Here there's a German belt buckle with several fragments that went through it. 
this is a guy's dog tag, a German soldier's dog tag, blown to pieces by a shell fragment, and uh, this was being worn by an 18-year-old soldier uh, when he was killed. So that's what shell fragments were for, for killing people, and they did it very effectively. Here you have a German soldier that was uh, blown to smithereens by a shell. Here you have a guy whose head was, uh, was completely pierced by a shell fragment. And even small fragments, such as this one that's about one centimeter, could be enough to, you know, fragment a major bone in your body and cause death. So we're going to end this video with a few uh, scenes that I filmed uh, during some uh, digging on battlefields. Here they're just trying to dig out the last German under the monument and for obvious reasons it wasn't possible to dig him out very carefully. But this is a part of the skull and you can see there's a part of a shell fragment which is part of a driving band of the shell. Which is really interesting because you can know what caliber, what country the shell is from and everything. And it left a green mark on the skull. So our Russian friends just found a, a body in a hole here. And it's quite interesting because the body was still wearing its helmet. It has two impacts on it. One on the right side that didn't go through the helmet, just caused a crack. And then there's a second impact on the left side that's very small. But this very small shrapnel fragment managed to go through the helmet. And since the helmet was still on the soldier's head, we can match that, that hole in the helmet up with damage on the soldier's skull. So this helmet has a huge shrapnel gash in it with an obviously corresponding hole in the soldier's skull. And inside the skull there was still a, a fragment of shrapnel. This is another helmet with a corresponding skull. You can see a tiny, tiny shrapnel hole in the helmet. And the the skull also has the matching shrapnel hole, so even that tiny piece was enough to, to kill the soldier. You can see there's a second shrapnel hole in the helmet here, and uh, it seems that that piece got embedded in the soldier's skin, but without penetrating the skull, and it left a rust mark there. And when emptying the earth out of this helmet, we find the the tiny shrapnel fragment that would have killed the soldier and made that hole in the helmet. Now this is the end of the video, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, if you would like to use this information in a more academic way, I published this information uh, in, uh, in an article in the Journal of Conflict Archaeology, so you can look that up on the internet if you need it as a reference. And as usual, I can be contacted at this email address if you have uh, some questions about World War II research. So, thanks for listening and see you in the next video.